Welcome to Hedge Fund Tips with Tom Hayes. I'm Tom Hayes, and this is your 206th video cast, 196th podcast for the week ending September 28th, 2023. Good riddance, September. We're happy to turn the calendar, and uh, we're seeing a little bit of that preview of coming attractions today in the market with a nice rebound. Uh, when I put the article out this morning, it did not look like a rebound, uh, and uh, and it's nice to see that that happen because the last part of the article was help is on the way, and it looks like it's starting to come in. Uh, so we're going to do a quick media. We've got a ton to get to. Uh, first and foremost, I'd like to thank the amazing Liz Clayman for having me on the Clayman Countdown in studio yesterday. Uh, also, Catherine Myers. Brad Hurst, Jake Mack, and Finley Walker, the incredible team over there at Fox Business. Uh, so we're going to go ahead and listen to this segment now. All right, let's figure out how investors should see the picture. To the floor show, we're joined by trader Tom Hayes and Northwestern Mutual CIO Brent Schutte. Tom, equities falling, yield spinning higher, and now the Russell 2000. Uh, actually, earlier was the one area of the grain. I just want to check it right now. And yes, it still is there. It's up about, let's call it 1% much more than the rest of them. So yeah. where are the flows yeah, right well, now? Because when money comes out of the markets, it has to go somewhere. That's right. What a difference a headline makes. I mean, we were just talking, uh, the, the whole market was red. Money is now flowing into energy. It's been strong all day. Industrials, small caps. Uh, it's been flowing out of healthcare all day. Uh, it's, it's been flowing a little bit out of tech, but that's starting to come back. We have semiconductors. We're starting to get bid. So the fear, as soon as McConnell came out of the shutdown, was serious because that's so what happened. So within the hour, you're within the about. hour, McConnell came out and said, "We're going to work to keep the government open." And as soon as that happened, the market completely rebounded, which shows the amount of fear around a shutdown. Okay, so just so you guys know, so the green room is about what uh, 50 feet out that yeah. way, and. Tom was there, I'm here, our producer's in the booth, and he's like, you know, you have to look. This is what I'm seeing from all of my traders and everybody that I'm looking at when it comes to the flows. And so you say that the SOX, for example, the semiconductor started to come back. Started to come back, and the VIX collapsed, which was very interesting as well. So, you know, you have a number of fears. You have the earning, the vacuum going into earnings season. People had low expectations for that. You have the seasonality. The 10 worst days of the year ended yesterday. So we're starting to move into a seasonably favorable period, but that was kind of hindered by the potential threat of a shutdown. Okay, Brent Schutte, do you, do you see that as part of the current bull market, a start of a bull market, or maybe just a bear market rally? No, I think we're headed towards more difficult times in the market in the intermediate term. And so I think more about the recession or no recession question, and I disagree with Brian Monahan. I do believe there is a recession that is likely in the coming months as the liquidity tourniquet the Fed has placed in the economy kind of continues to grind that spending to a halt. And so if you think about it, to me, the most important thing is inflation. That certainly has moved lower. But I think the final frontier for inflation for the Fed is wage growth. And wage growth right now is too high. The labor market is too high or too tight. And unfortunately, the only way that the labor market has uh, loosened in the past is through a recession. Uh, that drives wage growth lower, and that's what I think you're going to see in the coming months. Can I just say that one other comment that Brian Moynihan, Moynihan said was, the Fed has won the near-term battle against inflation. I'm not... I, I I'm not an economist, but I'm not sure that anyone on the Fed would say, oh, we won, let's wave our flags and say we did it, right, Brent? But let's just say that the truth is somewhere in between. Where are you investing? Because you guys have something like $265 billion in assets under management. Yeah, and so I think where it's important is they won the current battle. The current battle is based upon COVID-impacted uh, inflation. And so the economy was pushed out of equilibrium, and inflation followed exactly the same path we reopened. It went from goods to services within between about based upon uh, Ukraine and Russia pushing commodity prices higher. That bout is over. The bout that I'm worried about is a wage price spiral, and that's where I think the Fed is worried, and that's the final frontier on inflation. And that's where I think they have to pull that down. And the only way to do so is through a recession. Look, I, I think the, the, the good news for investors is that bonds now yield 5.35%. I think inflation will falter. And I think that gives you a real opportunity for real value in the bond market. And so we're tilting our portfolios more towards that direction to prepare for any coming recession and the reality that along with that recession, inflation is mm -hmm. squashed. And at 5.35% versus a 2% inflation target, I think you have a real opportunity to add value to portfolios in that manner. If you, if you see value as, and I'm not sure you do, Brent, but I know Tom does, as certain products that people will continue to buy no matter what the economy is doing. Tom, you actually like Generac, and I, I mean, you said this well before the open today. 
and it's up six and a half percent right now. Yeah, so they came out at their investor day this morning and mm -hmm. they reaffirmed their guidance. Uh, this is one of those stocks that has, has collapsed. It's down 80% off of its recent highs in, in 2021. Why? Mm -hmm. Because they over ordered and they over hired like many of the industrial companies like Stanley Black & Decker. Uh, but this company continues to grow. They're trading at 14 times next year's earnings as opposed to their average multiple of 29 times. Mm -hmm. They're basically the Kleenex of home standby genera uh, generators. And as we move toward electrification, we're seeing the grids go down. We're seeing uh, unusual weather events, and that all helps Generac. They're also preparing for the future with the battery power walls and the clean energy, and their commercial and industrial business is growing 30% year-on-year with the 5G rollout. So there's a lot of opportunity with Generac. It's exceptionally cheap, and we think this can be an easy double over the next 12 to 36 months. Double. Okay, yeah. it's at 110 right now, but yeah. the PE is certainly palatable. Correct. Okay, and, and Brent, when, when you hear names like that, what goes through your mind when... If I were to ask you, how does an investor remain tactically bullish, even if you believe, which you say you do, that we will dip into recession? Yeah, I, I think kind of similar story, but in a different context. I think for the intermediate term, I think there are lots of pockets of the market that offer good value. Uh, and so if, if you look at things like small and mid cap, which typically don't do well during a recession because they're economically sensitive, I think they've already discounted some of that. Small cap stocks, the S&P 600, trades at 12.8 times earnings that have already been marked down by about 15%. Mm. And so there is a margin of safety for those who want to invest with a longer term focus. So much more than the 12 to 18 okay, to 24 so months. Just, could you I would buy recommend. the index? Would you say buy the index? That's what Buffett would say. You could buy the index. Certainly, you could buy the S&P uh, 600 index. There are also pockets of opportunity in the stock market. Uh, the S&P 500, as Tom mentioned, there are spot, par parts of that market that are cheap also. And I think value stocks in general are cheap on a historical basis. And I think on the opposite side of this, which could be fairly sharp, I think there's good news uh, for the stock market uh, and for those investors in those parts. Great to see you both. Thank you Thanks very so much. much. Tom Hayes, Brent Schutte, uh, Senate and House leadership. And we're back. So... A uh, couple key things, actually, I wanted to just touch on because Brent, uh, my co-guest, pointed out that he disagreed with Brian Moynihan, the CEO of Bank of America, as it relates to the recession. So he has a more dour uh, outlook, uh, but it's predicated on a wage price spiral. And this is where I disagree uh, with his viewpoint in that what you're seeing and you know, he, he makes the point that uh, you, you can't get out of it without a recession. But what I would say is, is different this time is that the um, labor force participation rate. So, you know, you have a situation which you've also never had, which is money supply, M2 money supply running $3 trillion above trend. If you take the long-term trend line, we're still, so it takes a lot to absorb that. But as people are spending down that excess savings that they got in the form of stimulus checks, uh, et cetera, what's happening is they're going back to work. So you can put a cap to the wage price spiral two ways. Number one is you can just put people out of work. Uh, and, but number two is more supply can enter the workforce. And that's why we're seeing in recent reports that the average hourly earnings are moderating because as people spend down that savings, as their credit card balances go up, they go back to work. And we saw that uh, participation rate go up to 62.8. So I, I just kind of keep in mind, he makes some cogent points, but that one, uh, we didn't have time in the segment to kind of uh, uh, talk back and forth on that. But um, I think that's, those are some of the factors that make this time a little different. Uh, and, uh, and really the only real risk is that the Fed overshoots uh, however, you know, as we've said in recent weeks, number one, we didn't get much surprise in last week's Fed. As much as the market has acted a little crazy, seasonally crazy, uh, we got a pause and we got a threat. And remember, the threat is a major part of the tools in their toolbox to manage long-term inflation expectations. So the idea that the market had four cuts in next year, I thought was pretty aggressive. We've always kind of been in the two-cut camp starting uh, at the second half of next year and that they would try to keep rates higher for longer. Uh, and if all those things are correct, then we're going to continue to plot along. And I think as we turn the calendar, we're going to see more days like we see today. It's been a rare occurrence in the last few weeks that we see a green day, but uh, the cavalry is on the way. Moving right along. Um, oh, here are some 
I like to try and give kind of a look behind the scenes for folks who haven't been to studios, et cetera. This is what they call the green room. This is where you wait. And Liz referenced it on the uh, segment. Uh, this is where you wait when you're uh, planning to go on and you meet incredible people, people coming on and uh, before you and after you. And uh, so that's the green room for Liz's studio, which is on the ground floor. Uh, that's the outside the building. I've showed you that a few times. That's on 6th Ave and 48th Street. Uh, pretty exciting stuff. There's the Fox sign. And you could just see a tremendous amount of activity. And what I was particularly surprised about is all the activity walking from Bryant Park. It's about seven blocks away from where I am. Um, is that so many of the folks were wearing suits. Now, they don't wear ties like me. I, I always wear ties because I think when you're talking about uh, uh, people's money, it's a very serious matter and I take it very seriously. But, uh, you know, maybe I need to get the memo and loosen up a little bit. But leaving that aside, uh, a lot of folks were wearing suits uh, and, you know, mostly open collar, but a number coming back with ties. And it's just showing that the culture post Labor Day has really shifted people going back to, the, to uh, work, uh, people, you know, getting dressed up, people going in four or five days a week. Uh, so things are moving in the right direction. And uh, this is the, the door where you walk into the studio. And that's that. So I uh, also want to thank Diane Bartz and Samritha A for including me in their Reuters article today. This was about Amazon. Everyone's worried about the FEC, FTC suing them for monopolistic practices. And I'm basically saying that either way, the shareholders win. If uh, FTC loses their suit, it's status quo. If they win their suit, they break it up and the sum of the parts is greater than the whole and the cloud business will get a higher multiple. And then thanks to Adita Son Sonyi, Samritha Arunsalam, Bansari Kamdar, Aranya Rajesh, and Arshia Baj Bajawa for having me in their article last week as along with your you've read Yuvraj Malik and Adita Sony uh, as well. I want to, didn't get it time to get to this last week, but there was a really important interview with Pat Gelsinger of Intel, kind of explaining how they're going to compete with NVIDIA and uh, didn't get much uh, headline play, but I think this is the future. You know, we've always based our, since we've been talking about this since $25, uh, based our thesis on, um, they control the computer and the server market and just getting back to that working through inventories it's a 50 60 dollar stock and then it shot up from 25 to 38 overnight and now it's pulling back to the to to the mid 30s like we said it would probably happen after everyone got excited uh but what pat is talking about here is the new chips and no one's viewing intel as an ai play and he kind of lays out the case how that may be um unwise and uh and it, and if he's correct about you know 50 percent of what he's saying forget about 50 60 we could be in this thing for all uh, all time highs and then beyond based on how it's performing as his plan starts to unfold former in the dow today but about the best performer over the last month the company making a flurry of announcements here at its intel innovation conference the overarching question for the stock though can intel design artificial intelligence chips to chase down nvidia and fix its manufacturing problems in time to make them Joining me now to answer that question is Intel CEO, Pat Gelsinger. Pat, thanks for having me back in my second home in San Jose. Hey, always a pleasure, John, and really appreciate being on the show with you as always. Uh, so let's get straight to it. Uh, Gaudi, you, you announced for Gaudi 2, that's your existing chip, a pretty big customer in stability AI, mm -hmm. so that's heartening, but Gaudi 3 is the one that's really supposed to close the gap with NVIDIA. Is it on schedule? How soon in calendar 24 can we expect it? Yeah, so I say overall, you know, Gaudi 2, Gaudi 3 next year. We also disclose Falcon Shores here. We have a robust uh, roadmap for 23, 24, and 25. And Gaudi 2 is super important because it's sort of that on-ramp to Gaudi 3 and then to Falcon Shores, so that whole momentum of the roadmap. Obviously, the stability uh, announcement today is a big Gaudi 2 announcement. We also announced Dell as a uh, partner on delivering Gaudi uh, two based systems. But as you say, it's the warm up for Gaudi three next uh, year. We have uh, first silicon out of fab. It's now in packaging, looking very healthy so far. So we'd say the roadmap is on track and the ML perf scores, you know, the, the key machine learning benchmark uh, today, hey, is showing us we are very competitive with the market leader, NVIDIA. 
and in many cases, you know, finding, you know, oh, the best that they have is uh, about as good as Gaudi 2. So we're very competitive today, and obviously Gaudi 3 will be a big step up, you know, from there. And I disclosed the first details on that uh, today. But we're gaining momentum right now, and the market's starting to realize there's another opportunity here for AI leadership in the industry. As I mentioned, uh, the stock has been up considerably outpacing the overall semiconductor uh, you know, ETFs uh, over the past several weeks. But now I got to ask about manufacturing, right? Because these five nodes in four years, for those who aren't you know, fab geeks, that's moving at about twice the pace that Intel used to move. The longer we go with you saying that you're on pace in manufacturing, that, that's, a good, that's a good sign. So are you on pace? Yeah, and the five nodes, we first, Intel 7, done, that's you know, Sapphire, Rapids, Alder Lake, Raptor Lake, the, pro, the PC products that are now in volume. Intel 4, our Meteor Lake product, or today we announced the brand for that called Intel Core Ultra, right, you know, with the new AI capabilities. So that's now ramping in volume, so we'll say two are done. And we showed the server products for next year, what we call our Granite Rapids and Sierra Forest, and they're on our head of schedule. You know, so we'd say the next two uh, are on track. And then we showed the first uh, Intel 20A. And this is super important because this is the new transistor, the new backside power. You know, these are the breakthroughs. And as I said on stage uh, today, this new transistor, it is a Picasso. It is a work of art. And for somebody like myself, who's been in the industry for 40 years, right, it is spectacular. But the culmination is 18A. Right. And what we said today is, hey, we'll soon be releasing the final design rules uh, for that in the very near future so that the industry can start. And I'll be sending my first products uh, in the early part of next year for manufacturing. So it's on track. Mm. So two done, three on track. We're feeling really good about getting back to process leadership okay. and doing that from a manufacturing base in the U.S. and Europe. This is spectacular. Now, I've been hearing questions about gross margins, right, which have taken a big hit as you guys have, you know, uh, both gone into investing in capital to build out fabs and lost some market share over the past couple of years. And I think some people wanted to hear today about gross margins in 2024, but correct me if I'm wrong here, we don't know what inventories are going to look like heading out of Q4, which is right in front of us. It's a big question, a big issue that affects margins because of factory loads. Uh, and then as you're spinning up these new process technologies, that's what tends to hit margins too as you're getting a, a new process started. So is that why perhaps you're not saying too much about margins in 24? Well, you know, we're in the quiet period, you know, a couple of weeks left in the quarter. We, we just weren't going to give any more updates on the financials. Okay. And, you know, this, so far this quarter, you know, we said, hey, we got our first major prepay for 18A, our next process technology. So, you know, boy, you know, that's better than a customer name. You know, put money on my balance sheet to accelerate my manufacturing build out. You know, we also announced uh, that we were, you know, above the midpoint of our guide. You know, I'd also say, uh, hey, we were beat and raised the last uh, couple of quarters. And, you know, we'll be updating on our October earnings call. So I'll say overall, we've shown great financial discipline on cost savings. We've been beat and raised uh, as we've uh, gone through the year. And clearly, as we come up on our next earnings call, we're feeling the momentum uh, in the marketplace. The product machine is working. The manufacturing machine is doing well. But obviously, hey, the market has worked through a lot of inventory issues. Those we believe are largely behind us on the client side. We said we still have a little bit more work on the networking and on the data center side you know, for that. But of course, this is an expensive journey, yeah. right? You know, we're investing a lot, but we you know, lowered the margins and we've been consistently bringing them back on our head of what we've uh, committed to the street. So I'm feeling good about every aspect of the execution and our financial performance. Back to AI, but not necessarily in the data center this time. You talked today about the AI PC, and you and I have talked about how your expectation is we're going to move from you know, accelerators, from generative AI into more inferencing, and with those workloads, there's going to be more need for AI on the client, on the PC, on the phone, places like that, places where uh, Intel has more strength, let's say, than right mm -hmm. now in the data center. Is this AI PC a a preparation step in that direction. What, what are we going to get with that? Yeah, and you know, we, we see this idea of the AI PC, and I've described this sort of like a Centrino moment. You know, when we first brought Wi-Fi 
into the platform and now they would have cut the wires and changed everybody's life. And we see the AI PC that begins now with our next generation ultra you know, processor launch you know, is ushering in volume AI deployment. Hey, a little bit of Gen AI in the cloud, hey, that's fun but can I make it part of your everyday experience? Where, you know, we showed off today, uh, one of my favorite demos of today was rewind.ai. We're literally on the PC locally. I'm not sending my data to the cloud, no privacy concerns, but I'm able to record everything that I do on my PC and then be able to ask questions. When was the last time I talked to John Ford? And it will tell me when I spoke uh, to him. Yeah, you know, it will tell I did me see what that we, demo. right. You know, this is this is impressive, yeah. right? Uh, capabilities that are in place, and I don't lose any privacy concerns. All generated locally. It's too and you need developers though to take yeah. advantage of that. Absolutely. And, and write for the client in yeah. order for that to really work. Yeah, and I really see this as a next phase of development, right? And this is why it's a developer conference that we're here at with uh, innovation. Developers, one and all, and as I say, the killer apps are underway. That one to me was pretty compelling. Also, the hearing aid demo I did, right? Where, you know, literally it's now, my PC is now interacting with my hearing aids, real time, you know, transcription, language translation, you know, focus management, being able to suppress or enhance, you know, external effects for my Zoom or Teams call or whatever it might be on. It's going to be next generation creators uh, as well, where literally you're seeing, you know, uh, Gen AI and uh, being able to see image, you know, with GIMP. Uh, in real time and song creation, we're all going to become creators, but okay. with spoken language, mm. asking what to be done. So I think this is just you know, going to be the killer app is the AI PC, all right. and our product line is strong, and I believe that it will become a driver of an expanded PC marketplace. Well, we'll talk more about that, and I know you got earnings coming up, where I love to talk to you. So Pat Gelsinger, thanks once again for having me here. As always, at John. Intel Innovation. Hey Morgan, uh, you know, the, the stock did what it did today, but perhaps bottom line, Pat's saying they're still on track with uh, that turnaround strategy with design with manufacturing. Yeah, that got my attention too, John. I mean, great interview. And yes, I realize the company's in a quiet period, but he does sound pretty upbeat. I mean, just, you know, sort of pointing to the fact that they've already guided above the midpoint uh, above the midpoint of their previous of their guide and have beaten Rays over the last few quarters. I'm also I'm very curious about the hearing aid demo and your thoughts on some of these demos, which it sounds like you did yeah. yourself. Uh, that I did not do. I, I did, I thought I hadn't seen the Rewind demo, but in fact, I had. Uh, you know, the, the ways that AI can be used. We're in one of those periods where we're getting a lot of software-based AI announcement, and it's going to take that software to really drive demand for the chips and for the infrastructure. So, you know, this is when things are getting started, you know, but it's unclear how quickly they will get started. Intel trying to show, hey, before you assume you know who's winning this race, we're in. So, let's take a look at how this unfolds in the next couple quarters. All right, great stuff, John, from our own resident fab geek. Yeah. We'll see him a little bit later this hour. It's time. Uh, next one is the CEO of SL Green. We never bought SL Green when we bought Vernado in the, the low to mid teens because um, SL Green had some exposure to B and C properties. And we wanted to stay in the A property similar to what happened with the malls several years ago. The A properties with Apple and Lulu did fine. The B and C were toast. But he makes a good case for uh, occupancy rates, vacancy rates. And I think it's useful to listen into this interview. The occupancy issue, a lot of uh, analysts are worried across the country about uh, office building uh, occupancy rates. What is your vacancy rate today? How does it compare with a uh, year or two ago? And what are you forecasting for the future? Are you concerned, as some are, that commercial real estate is going to have some, some tough times ahead? Well, I think our least occupancy uh, is pretty consistent with with prior, we're in a bit of a downturn, so we're in the low 90s as opposed to the mid 90s. The physical occupancy, which is what uh, a lot of analysts are tracking and where they're trying to gauge return to office and how engaged people are. You know, in, in the peaks of COVID, we were down at 8, 10% physical occupancy. That's rebounded to about 60% physical occupancy uh, in the properties which has been a, you know, great to see and encouraging. We'd love to see it back up in the 70 to 75% where we were pre-COVID, 
and a lot of the tenants and heads of businesses that we're speaking to are focused on getting their people back in the office more days, more consistently. I think that'll have a big impact on leasing demand in the city, and I think the downturn uh, that, that you referenced may not be as severe as everybody is thinking it, it will be if we can get a little bit of time to work through the impact of higher rates. And just bouncing off that, obviously we have a Fed meeting tomorrow, interest rates front and center, and they have caused deal making to be next to impossible. There's a lot of new supply coming on the market in apartment and some in office, but when that comes through the pipe, we're told there are no deals being done because of higher rates. What, what would you like the Fed to know? Capital markets are frozen right now. I'll, I'll keep it realistic and I'll say I'd love to just see a little bit of forward guidance from the Fed in terms of where the top is so people can start to adapt to a rate environment that's at least stable, not uh, escalating every you know two months. Um, to have that kind of visibility would allow us to adjust our business. You, know, you can't turn around a building, a battleship in a day. You need to adjust business plans and start to plan for the future. It's very difficult to do that in the environment we've been in for the past 12 months or so. Great. Thank you so much, Andrew Mathias, president of SL Green. Guys, back to you. And we're back. And now the quote of the week, investment students need only two well-taught course, well courses, how to value a business and how to think about market prices. And it's interesting, the how to value a business is pretty easy to do. It's an art versus a science, but there are some basic principles, discounted cash flow, uh, using the right discount rates, uh, et cetera, et cetera. And we've covered a lot of those things on this uh, podcast over the years. But I think the more important course is found in The Intelligent Investor, which I can't recommend enough, and I have many times over the years by Ben Graham. There's a whole chapter on how to think about the manic depressive Mr. Market and how he serves up these prices on the basis of emotions. And it's kind of interesting because I got some um, very um, kind of like... Um, emotional based questions on Alibaba this morning when it was down a few percent and now it's moving back to the flat line. Uh, and this is the, what, what you see in the final washout phases, which we're going to talk about. But th the key question that you have to ask yourself, whether it's Cooper Standard on the auto strike or Alibaba um, uh, or even Intel on the upside when it moves 13 points in you know a couple of weeks or Vornado when it goes from you know 13 to 25 in a couple of weeks has the business or the assets changed that much either on the upside or downside in a short period of time that warrants such a manic price move and the answer is mostly no and that's why we love public markets because in the private markets these prices both on the downside when we're buying and on the upside when we're selling would never be entertained in the private markets and that's that widening of spread due to now here's the thing you have to be willing to step in when all the headlines are against you and most people can't do that and that's the discipline of being a value investor and then holding while it forms a base and and uh, builds up a new crop of uh, institutional sponsorship uh, as it um, uh, goes from uh, distribution to accumulation these are the basic things, but I'd strongly urge you uh, to read The Intelligent Investor and understand the, uh, how to think about market prices. That's probably one of the most important skills you're going to develop if you're going to do this uh, for yourself. Uh, but most of you are, are just going to build incredible business and, and lay it off to a professional like me to manage for you. And we're happy to do that as well. But uh, it's a good skill to have because it can serve you also in private business as well. Uh, this is from Seth Golden. This is the uh, from fun, via Fundstrat. And they're basically taking, uh, talking about the one-day option VIX. Yeah, there are one-day options now for people who can't lose money fast enough with weekly options or with monthly options. They can now do it on a daily basis. Kudos. Uh, and, uh, and what they're basically saying is when that uh, spikes above 20, you see bottoms in the stock market. That happened yesterday, uh, and um, and we think that's uh, pretty telling. Seth also puts out to one of the indicators we, we talk about on this, which is the uh, S&P stocks above their 50-day. You can see here it's at an extreme level that, uh, that there are usually some buying steps in. So 
nothing new here. Uh, bullish 12 month return rate of change margin debt signal. This is one I haven't seen before, but um, looks very positive. And what he's saying here, last 17 signals, a year later, the market was higher every time. We've just had one of those signals. And um, next is uh, today UBS upgraded uh, Generac Holdings to 160. I was on the claim and countdown yesterday talking about it at whatever it was, uh, 103. By the way, I have to put my show notes in the, the day before. So the fact that it was up uh, 6% yesterday was just pure luck uh, because the night before, I think the day before it was, uh, was red. So, um, you know, sometimes it just works out. Here's some data from China. You know, uh, China just can't do any worse. They're going to grow uh, GDP here is the median consensus. This is as of today, 5% GDP growth. Uh, their CPI is going to be uh, only 0.6%. Their PPI is going to be negative, which means they've got plenty of room to stimulate. Uh, industrial production is going to be up 4.3%. Fixed asset in, uh, investment up 3.9%. And retail sales up 7.7%. Retail sales up seven. If, if I told you that the United States retail sales were going to be up 7.7% this year and GDP was going to be up 5% and CPI was only going to be 0.6%, would you be a buyer or seller of equities? And, and you just can't make this stuff. You can't give away the equities. But that's all going to change and it's going to change soon. One of the key questions, um, ask me anything questions, was... You know, how's the US dollar going to go down? As a matter of fact, why don't I bring this one up? Because it's, uh, we'll do one early today. Um, okay, he goes into this whole thing. From my understanding, this is from Ite Naman. I'm confused about your US dollar weakening thesis. I'm sure you're confused about my Baba Long thesis and my uh, Treasury Long th thesis as well. Everyone gets confused when it's not working in the short term. And then when it's working in the long term, all of a sudden opinion follows trend and it makes perfect sense. But let, let's get to the substance of his question is, from my understanding, in the coming six months, short term rates will probably stay the same while the balance sheet shrinking uh, will raise long term rates. A weaker U.S. dollar is inflationary. So I guess the Fed will keep talking hawkish until it cuts short term rates. Also curious about different maturity rates affect exchange rates in your opinion. I'm starting to think China is waiting for the Fed to cut rates before they stimulate. Okay, so two things. Number one, you're overthinking it. Number two, it's relative tightness. So uh, European inflation is more pronounced than the U.S. inflation. They're probably going to stay a little bit tighter longer than we have to stay tight because of how quickly our inflation has come down, both at the headline and the wholesale level. Um, Given that long-term rates go higher and short-term stays the same while China slowly stimulates, um, why will the, the dollar weaken? So the thing about it is there's, there are so many different moving parts at any one point in time that this type of analysis is macro analysis, which is why Buffett always talks about I, I don't waste more than a minute doing macroeconomic na analysis. The key here is we are buying the highest quality asset in the lowest valuation market, which is China right now, at a great price with a growing economy and, and still a growing population for the next three to five years. And then it's going to fall off a cliff five, five years from now. So we can't control when the dollar is going to weaken, we can't control when the bonds are going to get bid, but we do know what inflection points look like based on positioning, based on crowding, based on extremes. And right now we are at extremes on both. We've got short-term overbought on the dollar. We've got short-term oversold on the 10-year treasury. And when that unwinds, whether it's today uh, you know, bonds were selling off like crazy and now they look like they're flatline. The, the uh, TLT is just going green as we speak. Um, it does, you know, the, the catalyst, I think, going into year end is going to be huge pension demand wanting to lock in those long term assets to offset their long term liabilities at yields they haven't seen in years. Uh, and that's going to create a bid in the long end of the curve that hasn't been there. And it's kind of a 
uh, there was an article today about a vacuum. Everyone's just waiting for someone else to blink and buy, and then they're all going to panic in. And that's just the way it goes. Opinion follows trend. Uh, and that will ease some of the stress um, uh, on markets and insulate it. The other thing to keep in mind, I read a good note by a guy named Brian Rich. Uh, he runs this uh, uh, group that tracks like um, public filings of big managers. It's, he, it's called Billionaire Portfolio. And, um, and it just tracks the 10Ks and it says, well, a lot of people are buying this, so you should look at this. But he writes some pretty good uh, notes. And what he said was, um, let's revisit the events of June and October of last year. In June of last year, the mere plan of the European Central Bank ending QE resulted in a blowout of sovereign yields in Europe. Uh, sovereign bond yields in Europe. The global tightening cycle was just getting started and Europe was already flashing warning signals of another sovereign debt crisis. An implosion of European sovereign debt would mean an implosion of the euro, the second most widely held currency in the world, and therefore an implosion in the global economy. The ECB called an emergency meeting to plan a response. They responded with a new plan, same as the old, to buy bonds of the weaker Eurozone constituents to defend against fragmentation, i.e. an implosion of the Eurozone. That turned the interest rate market on a dime and bottomed global stock markets. If you remember last fall, the ECB's plan, new plan, aptly named the Transmission Protection Instrument, was a public acknowledgement that they would rotely exit emergency level policy, uh, raise rates, reduce the size of the balance sheet while simultaneously manipulating markets to cancel the negative or destabilizing consequences, namely uncomfortably high sovereign debt yields. Uh, with the above in mind, the sovereign debt market in Europe has now returned to historically vulnerable levels. We should expect the ECB to execute on their plan. This is important, ladies and gentlemen, because when you ask a question like ETE, trying to think it through logically and not taking into account that the central banks are very active participants and coordinated active participants. But I think that's less important than the second half of this. He goes on to say, speaking of vulnerable levels, the Bank of Japan is once again looking at 150 USD to JPY. This is the level of yen weakness that proved to be intolerant to the Bank of Japan last October. Responsible for this yen weakness was the increasingly divergent monetary policies of Japan relative to the rest of the world, mainly relative to the U.S., and related to that by late October of last year, yields in Europe and the U.S. were trading at new highs of this tightening cycle, similar to right now, uh, creating stress not only for the Japanese currency, but for the global financial system. The Bank of Japan intervened on, in the currency markets to defend the value of the yen. That relieved pressure in the markets. The intervention event turned the interest rate markets, yields fell sharply, and fueled stock market rallies. I would be more, I would bet more likely on the Bank of Japan doing an aggressive currency intervention, which would weaken the dollar and strengthen the yen uh, in coming days or weeks than, than necessarily the ECB, unless the ECB has to be, unless the the market forces the ECB back into the market. So, so while you're looking at like, how's this gonna magically happen? It's not gonna magically happen. There's, there's gonna be, we're up at pressure points where intervention will be taken either proactively or reactively, and we're gonna see a reversal and we're gonna, we're gonna benefit from this. Um, okay, and then he also asked about Stone Co, which uh, Buffett owns, which we can cover later uh, a little bit. So good question, and there's the answer. I'd be watching for BOJ intervention based on where where their currency is and what's sustainable and acceptable to them and what's not. Um, okay, next is the valuation gap between China stocks, global peers grow. So these are at levels where you see big reversals and you see the big moves. We'll cover that. But at that inflection point, this is that final washout period. I had you know I had one guy saying, oh, what if it takes um, oh, what did he say? It's another one. I can always tell when we're close to an inflection because people start really going bananas. Hi, Tom. If it takes five years for Baba to move, won't that be a failure? Th this is the kind of extreme emotion. Five years. How did we get from, it's been forming a base for like a year, 
year and a half. It usually takes two years to form a base and then you get a para parabolic move. We, we've gone over this in Rico. And we, now he's talking about five years. So, you know, this is the type of manic like that Ben Graham talks about. Markets are manic. These are the people that sell to you at prices that would never be entertained in the public market because they get so emotional and they get so impatient. And that's never going to change. Human nature is never going to change, uh, which is fantastic for us. Uh, and, and we're very excited. So he goes, I'm tired of G and CCP not stimulating hard. I don't understand why the stock is going down after great earnings. So this is all just noise. It's going to stay where it stays until the regime changes. And as soon as the regime changes, i.e. maybe Bank of Japan intervenes, dollar uh, um, reverses its short-term uptrend for the last 11 straight weeks, uh, counter-trend bounce, dollar goes down, money flows into emerging markets. Alibaba is one of the greatest beneficiaries because of the weights and, and the structure of, it, of ownership. Uh, Alibaba starts to go up to, back up to 100 and then up to 120. And then all of a sudden, uh, people start to say, instead of why doesn't Xi stimulate more, they say, wow, Xi's been doing all this stimulus for the last 12 months. It looks like it's all starting to kick in at the same time. The narrative changes, everyone follows on, and you'll see these headlines. It's going to be, uh, it's predictable. But in the meantime, you get, uh, he sent me a sad face emoji. Uh, again, it's emotional. There's nothing that's changed between when it was 120 a few weeks ago uh, or $100 a few weeks ago, $120 uh, earlier this year. And today, the only thing that's changed is actually the fundamentals have gotten better, which is why I happened to put them into the article of the week. So the headwind that's changed is, has been um, the dollar has had a counter trend bounce. It had its peak in October of last year. We've had a counter trend bounce. Maybe it's going to peak again uh, at lower levels in October of this year before it rolls over abruptly. Uh, but what we covered last week was the sentiment uh, in in China in managers is is as low as it was last October before we got the sixty point rally uh, in a matter of twelve weeks. So. That's that. Carlton English, best uh, bank reporter in the business. Bank stocks are stronger than you think. It's time to get in. That's from Carlton English. Contrarian view, which is why I love Barron's. Uh, and I think she's absolutely right. I think uh, I think we're going to see, um, well, we'll cover bonds this week. But um, wow, pretty exciting turnaround today as we're watching this around 1244. Uh, this is from a guy named Scott Granis. I don't know him, but he's a retired guy and he says what the Fed is overlooking. And he's basically making the case that they're going to have to cut sooner than they think they are based on uh, what's happening to the housing market. Conclusion, the Fed is highly unlikely to deliver on its higher for longer interest rate target for much longer in coming months. Events are likely to transpire, which will convince both the Fed and the market that inflation is lower and the economy is weaker than com uh, commonly thought and that interest rates need to come down. So um that's another layer besides bank of japan and ecb for ite as to things that can cause it to reverse things that you don't know that you don't know and when they happen they happen all at once but the one thing that we're exceptionally good at is knowing what the feeling is what the structuring is what the positioning is at points of of um inflection and um, and that's that's where we are. And that's going to be the theme of the uh, article this week. Disney stock could climb 50 percent, J.P. Morgan says. So that was out uh, five days ago. Um, he says it could take a couple of quarters before we have to better clarify the company's direction. Shares begin to work. Um, we got a couple quarters. That's fine. Don't worry about it. <laughs> Get off the train. City's Jane Frazier sends tough message on big overhaul. So now she realizes time is ticking on her job. Time to take some aggressive action. And she's doing just that. Uh, we'll see if she's the one to get it done or they'll get someone else to get it done. But it's going to get done. And the margin of safety is great enough that we like it and we own it. Amazon prepares for FTC fight. The breakup isn't the worst outcome for the stock. We covered that in the Reuters article. IPO optimism grows, fueling hope for global recovery. Um, so this is interesting. This was out yesterday. I mean, they. I was surprised the bankers put out three IPOs into a weak market, but they did. 
Uh, and so, you know, you weak market, you're going to get weak results. But uh, I think these things will start to get rebid as the market stabilizes here going into uh, the next into Q4. Uh, and then all the bankers will rush out. Animal spirits will be back. And we'll start to see some positive things happening on that front. U.S. consumer spending rose at a weakest pace in, la in a year last quarter. So uh, second quarter sales, 0.8%. These are the type of data points that the Fed wants to see. Uh, this, this went unnoticed. U.S. and China agreed a new economic dialogue format. So they've now set up a, a structure to communicate on a regular basis. What's and then here's a guy out, Brian out Oppenheimer's Brian Nagel out. Sentiment around Nike's gotten way too negative. Uh, we have a ask me anything question on that this week, which we'll touch on. And then uh, Rejma Kapadia put out this article. Uh, we might have covered this uh, last week. Uh, China's in trouble, but it's no disaster. Don't run scared. And she goes through uh, all the things that are actually turning up, which we've covered. Uh, U.S. new car sales seem rising more than 13% in September. The, our thesis is playing out. Used cars would be toast because you can't finance them. New cars, uh, pent-up demand would be hit. OEMs would offer incentives like 0.9% APR, 1.9% APR. You're seeing it every single day, and they're continuing to fulfill. As it relates to Cooper Standard and the uh, strike so far, the strike has actually hit um, what they call replacement parts plants, and um, Cooper Standard doesn't do much replacement part business. They do parts for uh, new cars, and none of the major truck plants have been hit, which is where the bulk of their business goes. Think F-150s, et cetera, and Ford has been spared um, most of the pain, if you know, they came to kind of an impasse where they did not accelerate Ford's strike while they accelerated the others. So in terms of business, what's changed between when the stock was at $23 versus when the stock's at $12? Uh, I think if anything, we probably saw a little pull forward because a lot of the OEMs, uh, their, their headlines out that they tried to push production ahead of the strike. So maybe we'll see a bump up in volume. Obviously, it's not going to help anyone if this drags on forever and they, they close more plants. And I think, you know, with some of the suppliers, including Cooper Standard, they're down on fears that will happen. Um, but, um, uh, you know, these things have a way of working out sooner or later, whether they work out through a bad agreement, which the will force the OEMs to push more plants off, uh, offshore or an amicable agreement where everyone meets in the middle, no one's completely happy, and they go on. But the real issue is the administration's aggressive push into EVs is going to cost about 40% of the workforce. So there's no two ways around it. You can't have, you can't have your cake and eat it too. If you want all, everyone to drive an EV, we're going to need 40% less workers because we don't need as many workers to assemble EVs as we need to assemble ICEs. Uh, so that so that's the trade-off. And I think everyone's coming to terms with that. Uh, and that's the direction that this administration wants to go. So um, probably the best move would be to do some type of temporary agreement for a year and see how, um, you know, executive policy plays out uh, over the next four years. But um, it is where it is at the moment. And at least we've seen some modest progress. We'll see tomorrow if there's any more progress. But uh, that's the story. Uh, Alibaba's first, uh, the logistics arm right here filed, filed for their first IPO. So the, some of the parts are coming out. I mean, no matter how much they break it up until the dollar weakens, we're not going to see the benefit. But once that happens, the more parts they are, the more realized value we're going to get with the sum of the parts and the applied multiple. So it's great to see that they're taking action. They can't control the inflection point, but they can control getting the pieces ready uh, for action. And then the other thing we saw is Freshippo, the Costco of China. They've been opening a store a day in September in expansion frenzy. Does that sound like a, <laughs> an economy that is sucking wind, that they're opening a, basically a Costco a day? They opened up 30 stores across China in September. Uh, to keep up with consumer appetites for fresh food from around the world. This is mind boggling to me. Imagine if Costco opened 30 stores in 30 days. And this is ahead of the IPO for 
Freshippo, which is going to be monstrous. People don't even give it any credit in their valuation for BABA. It could literally be the next Costco in China. China's economic situation isn't as dire as it seemed, and policymakers in Beijing were just expecting too much too soon. So the um, country's economy is still on track to grow 5% this year per OECD forecast. Um, Beijing has been disappointed due to outsized expectations for economic growth. So if you want more, do more, you know, do more stimulus. But uh, it seems to be catching up and, and moving in the right direction. China's industrial profit, profits jump sharply as economy stabilizes. This was last night. And PO, People's Bank of China vowed to provide more forceful support for the economy. So they just keep putting it out there. It's going to compound. It's starting to catch. Um, profit at China's industrial firms rebounds after extended slumps. This is a big hockey stick jump here from negative 6.7 in July to positive 17.2% in August. No one will pay attention to this until the dollar weekends and, and stock prices start to go up. But uh, this was a shocker this morning and, uh, and uh, no one's paying attention to it yet. If China's so weak, why are commodities so strong? Uh, by the way, I don't serve up these ads on this uh, Zero Hedge website. But the case that he's so if it's uh, not uh, user friendly, just ignore them. Uh, they're basically saying if China's doing so poorly, why are commodities de demand so big? And uh, he, he says, so demand for commodities at idiosyncratic micro levels is outperforming China's macro economy. Is this a structural change that remains to be seen? But for anyone who's bearish on China, Shorting commodities hasn't been a great trade so far. Uh, we agree. And here's the article of the week. Is it really different this time? Stock market and sentiment results. And my answer is I wouldn't make that bet. I went through all these instances and because we had this breakout of the 450 level. So um, history shows at least 11 times since 1960 that many of these breakouts in yields actually wind up being fake outs in yields and don't buy the hype. I'm always skeptical of people say, buy the breakout, buy the breakout. You mean buy from people selling to you at the top, uh, which is, you know, more than anyway. So that's that. For everyone shorting bonds in the hole, keep in mind that buying breakouts in yield doesn't always end well. And we've gone through the positioning here is at an absolute extreme. It's very common to get these overshoots just to shake out all the, you know, so you can get these uh, sad face emojis and emotional people that are getting destroyed because they're on leverage, which, uh, you know, we continually repeat Buffett's words of wisdom, the three killers uh, in excess are ladies, liquor and leverage. You can avoid those three in excess. You'll 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 do just fine in the business. And um, uh, but the, the people that uh, do this panic stuff, they, they do it only because they're either A, impatient or B, they've taken leverage because they're greedy and neither of those things work and, uh, you know, find a new pastime. Uh, so um, we covered my notes ahead of the segment. Uh, secret to happiness is low expectations. We're in an information vacuum going into earnings season, but expectations are extremely low at negative Two tenths of one percent uh, on average. The last few quarters, the estimates going into earnings have been three full percentage points too negative. I think this time will be no different, which implies a plus three uh, percent actual uh, year-on-year growth. And uh, would you want to be short with that type of outcome? And the answer is probably not. We just put the worst 10 days of the year seasonally uh, for the market in the rearview mirror that ended on September 26th. Uh, and then as far as the shutdown fears, uh, if you look back through shutdowns, actually even downgrades, that's what causes uh, the long end of the curve to get bid. So in 2011, it did for sure. Um, so that might be a catalyst to lower rates. And, you know, maybe that's part of the plan. Who knows? But um I wouldn't be buying this breakout in yields, that's for sure. And we've covered that many times. Positioning managers are still taking the lowest level of risk since uh, less than the COVID lows and right in line with the lows of 2009. In both of those cases, if you were buyers, you made bank. The names we talked about were Generac, which you heard, and Stanley Black & Decker. Uh, the interesting thing about Stanley Black & Decker is they o overbought uh, inventory and they overhired like so many industrial companies. What's interesting is they've already taken out $430 million of cost. Their revenues have held up even though their earnings and their 
Um, cash flow got cut in half. The stock was down peak to trough almost 70%. Uh, but they expect to have $2 billion of costs out of the business by 2025. That's just a, you know 15 months from now, uh, which is $13 a share. To put that in perspective, this stock traded at $209 a share on $10.85 of earnings just a couple short years ago. If they take $13 a year, uh, $13 a share out in cost, plus you know uh, earnings power of five, six, seven dollars, you're looking at $18 of earnings. Even if you have half the multiple you had two years ago, uh, this thing can move a lot, and that's why we own some of it. So uh, pretty exciting there. They've taken their inventory down. By 200 million, they're gonna. That should be down 750 to a billion by the end of the year, and then the game will be back on. So again, another potential double over the next 12 to 20 uh, to 36 months. As always, opinion, not advice. Click on terms. Uh, check with your financial advisor before doing anything. Uh, I don't know your financial situation. I deal exclusively with accredited investors and qualified institutions. Now. As it relates to China, a friend sent me an article from Barron's and the lady was saying, you can click on the full article here, um, there's nothing the government can do about demographics which are unfavorable. She's relating to China. And so she's bullish. She's saying just buy the US and don't buy uh, international, don't buy China. Um, and that's, you know, opinion follows trend. US has been going up, they chase US. China has been going down. They sell China. Uh, I agree with the U.S. outlook. I think there's still bargains in, in the U.S., but we wouldn't chase the indices per se. Uh, but I disagree with their China. And the statement, there's nothing the government can do about demographics which are unfavorable, is correct five to ten years from now. It could not be more incorrect for the next three to five years. Her call is akin to calling the J Japanese top in the Nikkei in 1985. And for those of you who know history, the problem is the top happened in 1989, preceded by a four years of uh, parabolic move in the stock market. So I've discussed this quite a few times during the normal bottoming process in Alibaba, China. The neighborhood in China is slowly improving, sure, slowly but surely. We saw it overnight with some of those uh, industrial profits. BABA, however, will not break out without the country and emerging markets breaking out, which is a function of the dollar, which is also a function of rates, which we think is near inflection points. But it will outperform when the shift occurs. And we are in the final washout stage when the impatient and emotional are finally flushed out. And that's the sad part is even people who have stuck with it with six or 12 months while it's been going through this bottoming process, uh, a lot of them will get flushed out on this last leg down right before it turn, turns around and, and goes in the other direction. And that's just the sad nature. But, you know, like I always say, they don't give away multi-baggers for free. You got you to gotta suck it up and take some punches in the gut before you get the glory. And um, that's just the way the world works. So um, you can see the full article here. So this is the Alibaba chart. We covered this last week. It just takes two years to bottom after getting these crashes in 15 to 17, then parabolic move, 18 to 20, then parabolic move. And here we are in 22 to 24, you know, we're getting to the end of the year here, and then we'll likely get a parabolic move. Hope it'll be like last fall, where in October is the inflection point, and then we go straight up into the end of the year. That would be a nice way to end the year. Uh, emerging markets, uh, same exact story. So if you think, oh, it's Alibaba, it has nothing to do with Alibaba. It has everything to do with the dollar. Uh, but here's emerging markets, the exact same chart, consolidation for two years, then parabolic move, consolidation, parabolic move, and it's doing the same exact co consolidation. So as much as we cover Alibaba's fundamentals, you could just overlay it with the emerging markets. It would make no difference. On the way up, it will make a difference, but right now it doesn't. And uh, this just shows what we've talked, reverse head and shoulders, measured move is 60 points. That takes you up to 180 for the first move. So do we go back down to 80 and touch this bottom once again? We could, uh, but you know, I think we're kind of getting to the point where <laughs> there are no sellers left and we should make this next move higher. Um, now, the bulk of the Japanese population, to this author's point, was this would be what she's saying about the Chinese market right now. The demographics of China are like they were in Japan in 1985. Look what happened to the Nikkei from 1985 to 1990. We've talked about this demographics. So if you look at, 
you reverse engineer this data from 2021, going back to 1986, the bulk of their population, which you can see here, which is now you know 73 to 75 years old today, was 35 to 37 back in 86. And the bulk of the spending happens from the early to mid 30s till they turn 40 and then it aggressively slows down and the stock markets tend to act in the same way. And right now we have the Chinese, this bulk part of their population uh, is 33 to 36 years old. So right around the same age that they were in 85 to 86 in Japan. And that's when you just get the massive spending boom. And once they get the confidence and now we're seeing them get their sea legs after being locked down for three years, that's when you get these type of things. If you think about even the spending wave from 2000 to 2002, it in the developed world that um, you know did the COVID uh, in a better fashion than Chinese did from a policy perspective, that's what happens. And then I just put the fundamentals here, but no one cares about the fundamentals now, no matter how much they grew revenues, earnings, 56% cash flow, uh, $25 billion of free cash flow last year, and you can't give the stock away. You, you literally can't make this stuff up. Uh, here's Cooper Standard. I put this here um, just to kind of put it in perspective uh, because we got an AMA question. Can you give insight into the details of Cooper Standard's debt refinance? I'm trying to understand how they'll be affected by changes in interest rates and if their debt burden will be manageable higher for longer environment. And the short answer is it won't matter as the bulk of the maturities were pushed out fixed rate to 2027 during the refinancing. Even the $42 million left on the 2026 notes that weren't redeemed uh, allows ample time. Those come due November 2026, by the way, and that's only $42 million. Allows ample time to refinance and for volumes uh, and operating leverage to kick in our original thesis. Not to mention, even the most recent hawkish dot plot predictions point to a decline in rates starting in 2024 and more declines in 2025. So if the re first refinancing isn't till 2026, November 2026, the Fed is projecting that uh, by 2026, the Fed funds rate will be 2.9%. So uh, that's a lot lower than 5.6% uh, for those of you not following along. Uh, so that'll be a favorable environment for them. As far as what's happened to the business between the $22 stock price and a $12 stock price, the answer is nothing. If anything, the business is probably doing very well this quarter. Nothing from the strike has impacted it. The fear about what may come from the strike would impact it. But even if they got shut down for two months, which would be like a worst case scenario in the end of the end, and, and Biden would have to come in with cash because he wants to get elected next year. Um, uh, I think what you would see is they would just draw on their ABL line, which they have about 200, uh, how much do they have? I think 250 million of a liquidity. Let me see. 156 available on the ABL. They, this 73 million cash actually went up. They implied on the call uh, uh, between the time they closed the quarter and the time they were giving the earnings conference call. So let's call it 250 million. That's more than enough to get them through two months, probably more than enough to get them through, you know, a year and a half or a year. I'm not exactly sure on that. Probably a year plus uh, with nothing going on, but that's not the game plan. Um, the powers that be will intervene before anything like that happens. So to answer your question is they have asymmetry to the downside, meaning their upside in rates is now capped and mostly pushed out to 2027. Uh, by which time the volumes will be more than sufficient, uh, probably by next year, more than sufficient uh, on the new cars because no one's buying the used cars at you know nine or twelve percent financing. They're buying the new cars with the dealer in, with the uh, OEM incentives at 0.9 percent APR, etc. So uh, we're excited about that. Um, I think um, I think the final piece we we. Um, yeah, so, th so that's the story, and uh, we've been taking advantage of that with the, some of the new clients that have come in, and uh, we're very lucky that that happened. We were hoping that would happen from the strike, and uh, for uh, everyone else who, you know, <laughs> bought it at five fifty, dollars what felt like uh, the second coming of the Messiah at $22 is now humbled back to $12. It's just we got to deal with the mark-to-market. It's just noise. Uh, but over time, nothing's changed in the thesis. And uh, if you look 12 months out, 
where the business is going to be. I think 22 is going to be uh, distantly in the rear view mirror as we look up to uh, greener pastures and the operating leverage starts to kick in and the volumes and everything else that has been moving in the right direction in recent quarters. For those of you worried about EVs, they make more money per EV. So uh, to the extent the administration wants to push that, that's never been in our thesis to get back to $7 of earnings power, but um, we'd happily welcome it because they'll make more money for the same amount of vehicles, which is unlike most auto supplier parts, which uh, the perception is the other way. These are the estimates of production. These seem to be going above estimates so far. Uh, consistently, as we saw with retails, with uh, new car sales for September already, with all this noise and consumer sentiment being uh, bad and inflation and all these negative things and shutdowns, people are still buying brand new cars. And that's never going to change because why? Because we're Americans. That's what we do. So um, uh, here's I just wanted to get out the data, how they improved uh, year on year and remind you <laughs> that the business is actually moving in the right direction, despite the stock price in the short term because of the UAW noise uh, guidance they reaffirmed. And then Generac, which we talked about uh, uh, on uh, claiming they did their investor day yesterday and they, they really laid out um, very what I think is conservative, but the market viewed as uh, very uh, strong projections going into 2026. I think this is just beginning with the electrification and the weather events. They're looking at doubling EBITDA over the next three years. <clears throat> and um, and I think if they can do that, you know, doubling EBITDA and getting revenues above where it was in 2023 when the stock traded at $500, uh, I think uh, I think our estimates of a of an easy double over the next 12 to 36 months might be very very conservative, but that's how we like to think about things. And then when it hits our target, we either lay off to excited people, uh, or if the fundamentals are continuing to improve, we'd love to hold it and hold a great business. This has been a historically a double digit compounder, and we think it's going to continue to be. And uh, it was just a hiccup with overstocking during COVID, over hiring, and um, and not working through their CNI business continues to grow. They actually made a point of that uh, on the investor presentation as far as the amount of towers. They're in the EV charging business. They have the smart thermostats. They have all these uh, battery storage walls and all these green save save the seals uh, type of technologies. And that's a good thing. And um, yeah, here's the sell sites forecast, which is also in line with our CCI uh, thesis, which will also turn the corner as rates turn the corner. And then um, mix. So you can go through these on your own, but the, you know, here are the key takeaways, how they're going to uh, take it to the next level and path to doubling EBITDA uh, by 2026, which would be pretty exciting and, uh, and growing revenue at 12 to 14% compounded which they've done historically, and I think they'll do again in a material way with their proprietary 8,700 person dealer network. Uh, history doesn't repeat, but it does rhyme. Value stocks are still cheap. What's interesting about this and what clicked in my mind when I saw this this week from Bloomberg was that value multiples haven't been this stretched to the downside relative to growth since 2001. And much of our framework is setting up similarly to this period when emerging markets in China small caps and value stocks dramatically outperformed in ensuing years. Uh, it's always darkest before dawn. And you can see emerging markets were up 485% uh, percent in the, the next uh, few years following similar conditions. Hang Sang was up 289%. Small caps were up 167% and the value index was up 142%. Help is on the way in terms of seasonality. Here is the... Um, uh, 30 year seasonal pattern base building process in late September and first half of October. So you can see you are here is the famous thing that sign that you see in the mall. Uh, we've had this uh, sell off in August and September, and now we're building the base to move higher with the turn of the calendar is our expectation. The market's trying to sniff that out today. We'll see if it holds. My guess is uh, we probably have some weakness into the close with the shutdown over the weekend. And then uh, once the shutdown happens, it'll probably be sell the rumor by the news uh, is my best guess. Here's the weekly seasonality we've covered many times. Worst 10 days of the year from um, Ryan Dietrich over at Carson. That ended on the 26th on Tuesday. So we now move into a more favorable period. You can see it here as well. Next couple of months are the strongest of the year. 
And then uh, shutdowns actually tend to resolve positively 12 months out. Our last, the last shutdown was the longest in history, 35 days. S&P was actually up 9.4% during the shutdown. And then um, earnings uh, estimates are low, negative 0.2% for this quarter. And yet the GDP now is showing um, plus 4.9%. So even if it's only 2.5% or 3% GDP, it seems unlikely that you'd have negative earnings growth. So we'll see. Uh, the secret to happiness is low expectations. I like the fact that bearishness, uh, retail people are fearful again, 27% bullish, down from 49% at the beginning of August, 40% um, bearish, up from 21% at the peak in August. So that's good to see. Uh, managers are still underweight at 54.33%. Fear and greed's at an extreme fear at 25. These are all the conditions uh, set precedent for uh, things to start to recover in coming days and weeks. And then um, Dow earnings. This is interesting. I have to double check these because uh, George was scrambling to get them done, but I, but they look about right. It looks like UNH came down a little bit. Goldman Sachs came down a little bit. Uh, and Microsoft came down a, a little bit. So um, so earnings are revised down, top 30 weights of the Dow, down 3.17% for this year, 3.19% for next year. So it'll be interesting, and that's that's been priced in. We're at 240, we're still at 248, but it came down like, I think, 50 cents in the last week. So I like that estimates are coming down into earnings. Um, we want to see them proven wrong as we get earnings and guidance. So that'll be an important thing to pay attention to. Same thing with the NASDAQ, a hair down, uh, less than a percent down for this year, less than a, uh, a 0.81%, 81 basis points down for next year for the NASDAQ top 30 weights. Um, so we'll see how that pans out. I think they're going to wind up coming in better than expected. So let's take a look at some of the questions that we haven't answered. And then we'll wrap it up. We do have a decent amount. Uh, Stoneco. Everyone keeps asking about Stoneco in Brazil, uh, which tells me I should be buying more China. But um, I think, you know, the, the problem with these consumer finance companies in Brazil is no matter how good you a work you do, nothing's going to change until the dollar weakens. It's just like China number one. And number two is you're never going to get full transparency into the financials of these businesses. No matter what management tells you, there's no way you're just, you're making a bet that everything's going to be okay. And I think in the case of Stone Co, um, it's so beaten down. Let me take a look at the balance sheet here. Uh, it's a 5 billion, 2 billion, and cash flow, generating cash from operations. Where did they get hurt? Oh, they repaid some debt. Positive free cash flow. I mean, you know, without doing an enormous amount of work on this, I think it's probably moving in the right direction. You're going to have to, it, it's not going to change until this changes. EWZ, which is the Brazil ETF, which someone else asked about saying it's the same price as 2027. But remember, this is the conditions precedent and this had a monster move. This had a 25X, by the way. So I do think you wanna to start to get some um, exposure to Brazil if you, and China and, and these type of things. And you gotta take a three year view because it could change overnight on Monday and then you'll, you know, you'll never catch it up or it could take another year. But I think it's gonna be sooner rather than later. And, um, if you just play it with the ETF is one way, or you could play it with uh, leverage plays on it, like Stone Co., which Buffett owns. I think you just have to size it proportionally. Uh, maybe, you know, maybe a 2 or 3% position in case there's something that you can't figure out no matter how much work you do, and it turns out that their consumer portfolio is bad. But uh, I don't think you're going to have that situation with Stone Co., and um, I would just manage your risk by how you size it. And don't do it, obviously, don't do any leverage, as we always say. Uh, and I think you'll be just fine. So that was from Robert Y. And actually, let me just uh, delete these so I'm not doing them twice. Oh, this is interesting. Okay, this is from Jack McCarty. 
Hi, Tom. Love the weekly podcast. Thanks for the great value. I was wondering if you could take a look at Under Armour. It looks cheap to me at these levels. So let's do that. I think we covered it before. And I basically said if they can't turn things around with Tom Brady and Steph Curry, there's no hope for this stock. But um, I'm willing to be proven wrong and be burdened by the facts. So let's take a quick look. I mean, I think that I think the play with all these, whether it's uh, Owen, and I wanted to buy a second pair of ONs this week, so we're probably getting close to a top on the stock because by the time I bought five pairs of uh, Allbirds, that stock had topped and it was toast during COVID. Um, so maybe we need a few more pairs of ONs. But at the end of the day, Nike always wins. Just just don't forget that. <laughs> That's really, you know, they had a saying after I was watching Tiger Woods uh, documentary on the plane ride home from Dallas. And um, after he went through that stuff, you know, problem with his personal life, I think in 2009, he came out and won the next tournament and Nike put out a commercial winning takes care of everything. And, uh, and I think they live by that credo because uh, that's all they do is win. So um, Nike. All right. Um, oh, I'm sorry, not Nike. Although someone else asked about Nike, so maybe we'll do both. Let's do, let's do one at a time, UA, Under Armour. All right, so uh, cash flow from operations negative, cash flow from investing negative, cash flow from fin financing negative, free cash flow negative, um, balance sheet, 700 million of cash. Do they not have any debt? Uh, yeah, they do. Um, okay, so not a ton. They're not over levered. Let's see what's going on with sales. Did I even pull it? Did it? Did I pull this one up? No. Okay. So revenues have basically flatlined, modestly growing. They're earning money, but they're losing, they're burning cash. I, you know, this is just a low quality me too business, but I see your point as like, I, if you wanted to play it for a trade, um, I don't think they're going bankrupt, but this could just be a trap because it's it's kind of a declining business, burning cash. Um, you could probably play it for a trade back to 15 if you're lucky, but I, I just don't know what the catalyst would be. So for us, we're a pass, but I understand why you were thinking about it the way you were. Um, but that's, it's, it's, it's not a business I would want to own. And that's really what I do when I buy a business. All right. So Bob Johnson says, I offered up a dud in Unity Net last week. So looking to make, make up for it. Uh, first off, there's never a dud. The fact that you had the courage to send in a ask me anything question makes you a winner to start with because most people are too scared. And number two, um, can you take it? Okay. So can you take, and, and number two, that's how you learn. So, um, you know, having duds is part of the process to having multi-baggers and that's just the way it goes. Um, can you take a look at dollar general forward P 13, six shares outstanding down 30% pays a 2% dividend shares are down 55% five year lows working through free stimulus money and optimizing their supply chains. Chairman of the board purchased stock at a price of 156. Da, 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 da. Average family. You can do that. Thanks and keep up the great work. All right, Bob, let's take a look. Dollar General. I think I'm going to like this one with you. Okay, so it's just had a heart attack. Question is, how long does it take to bottom? And at what price does it bottom, right? So... <clears throat> Uh, 
the free cash flow is declining. Revenues keep going up. Let's see, DG. By the way, I have to be on, I'm going to be on Yahoo today. I don't know if I'll get this out beforehand at 3.30. So excited to do that. Uh, thanks to Taylor Smith, Clothier Smith, for doing that. And by the way, congratulations. Taylor had a new baby. I don't know if she, I don't think she told me what it was going to be, boy or girl. So, um, but they've got a new baby and uh, she's on leave. She's the produ amazing producer over at Yahoo. All right, so here we are on Dollar General. Cash from operations is cut in half in the last three years. Cash from investing, what are they doing here? Uh, CapEx is pretty high. And then they... Oh, it looks like they refinanced some debt. Yeah, I mean, their free cash flow is really dwindling. I guess people are worried about that. Seems like it's just in decline a little bit. Cash is uh, down a billion dollars in the last couple of years. Although, historically, it had been down. So, let's just see how much debt they have. $7.2 billion of debt, $300, $300 million of cash. That's the problem right there. Um, with no like catalyst. It's not like the poor consumer has all this pent up demand like we're seeing with autos. Yeah, I, I think, um, you know, revenues continue to grow. Did I pull this up? Yeah, here we go. So where's the stock at right now? It's at uh, $105, wow. I mean, at 80, I would definitely start to buy it. I don't know if I'd buy it at 100 just yet because I, I wanna see some stabilization in the financials first. Um, So the dividend. Yeah, the debt's really ballooned up since 2022. They must have done an acquisition or something. Or, but yeah, I don't. I'm a little concerned about their balance sheet, but I don't think they're going out of business. Um, I'd have to do more work on that. I think you're on the right track. For me, there's just, it's had a heart attack and I'm willing to miss this one because I think it's gonna take a while to kind of stabilize and it's just, uh, everyone's running out of the theater right now. So I would definitely, I'd probably put in an alert at 80. If it hits 80, I'd probably start to do a lot of work on it. Um, but for me, the margin of safety is not great enough. I want to see some stabilization first and then we can look at it. But I generally think your process or your framework for asking this question is, is right on. I think, I think you're basically just, I think you're a little too early on this one would be my takeaway. And I'm fully willing to be wrong to think it bounce up to 160 tomorrow and we missed it. But, um, Perfectly fine with errors of omission, not commission. All right, so Anurag Gupta asked, thanks for sharing your insights, knowledge, and business evaluation process. Enjoy your podcast and eagerly await each new episode. Thank you very much for watching. Appreciate your thoughts on Doximity. Here's another thought for you, Hibbit. It's a footwear and apparel retailer in underserved communities, extremely low valuation, no debt, high return on capital, and... Decent margin profile. So, H-I-B-B. Uh, 
Yeah, I guess that my initial thought is, is this a foot locker or is this a boot barn? You know, foot locker is a train wreck. Boot barn has been a beast. Um, I don't generally like this type of business, but let's take a look. All right, so revenues are growing. EBIT seems okay. They're earning eight bucks a share down, eight and a half bucks a share down from 11. Balance sheet, $33 million of cash. And no debt, still generating cash from operations. They have a decent amount of regular CapEx and cash from financing. They repurchase some stock, free cash flow positive. Decent at compounding capital. Um, there's nothing that I can see at initial blush that would say there's a problem here. Obviously, it, you know, you have to start your work now, go through all the conference calls, look at the competitive profile, understand the business a little bit better. But, um, Just want to see something here. What were peak earnings? 11. So even at the peak frenzy, the thing was only trading at like nine or eight. So when you look at the multiple, you're like, wow, this is a low multiple. But this business has apparently never been assigned a decent multiple because it's not a great business. Um, there's just, there's not enough margin of safety for me, but... Um, it probably worked for a trade up to the 60s, but I, I, it's, I, you know, it's funny. It's like the old saying, the young man knows all the rules, the, the, the old man knows all the exceptions. On paper, this thing looks like it should be fine and it should work great. But just knowing this type of business uh, profile, uh, it's hard for me to get excited about it. So, um I think you would be okay, but I wouldn't, you know, it's, it's not something that, that we would take a look at. And I think the same holds true for Foot Locker at these levels. It's just um, as cheap as they are. It's just like, I, I don't even want to play in that, in that sandbox. Um, but good question, Bob. I think you're, I think you're okay. Or uh, that was on your end, uh, rather. I think you're okay in terms of your process. I think find some others that don't have kind of the just just better businesses I guess is what I would say um, okay so we already covered Ite's dollar and um, stone Co question good questions Tila tap looking into a cigar butt as it seems to be better for those with small portfolio what's your thoughts on NAAI N A I I Natural Alternatives International. All right, let's take a look here. Let's 
So the revenues have come off since that 2021 peak. Their net income is down 80%. Don't love that. Uh, 13 million of cash. 30 million of debt. High CapEx for this business. Uh, free cash flow negative. Um, nutritional supplements. I mean, this tends to be a volatile business. I, I would say um, I mean, you have to understand how our sales and earnings are going to turn around. They, management has to have some story. We've got this new thing. It's been growing at 20% a month for the last six months. We think it's going to, because otherwise it's just a trap. Um, so, this is generally not a great business, but I, I'd be open-minded, but you have to do a lot more work. Listen to the last eight conference calls, look at the investor presentations, understand the product, who are the customers, are the customers businesses growing or declining also. But I'm gonna say um, I'd be cautious on this one, even though I know why you picked it and it's not a terrible pick and I think it probably works for a trade, but it's not really a business I would wanna own. Okay, here's a good question from Aaron. He's talking about the yield curve um, that uh, stocks usually perform fairly well, like 12 to 18 months after the yield curve inverts, but later um, stocks usually crash. Okay, so what's different about this time in our view is that We, everyone's looking at the last three instances and what they should be looking at, the closest example is uh, 1980 and 1982 when it inverted twice in short order. And most inversions come after a long period of not inverting. So you get your inversion, then you wait um, then you uh, wait like six you know wait uh, twelve to eighteen months, get your recession, and then recovery, and then another six years. So the situation we have uh, this doesn't go back to eighty two um, in nineteen eighty to nineteen eighty two unfortunately, um, let me just see if I have. Here. It goes back to, yeah. Is you had an inversion and then a second inversion in short order. And what most people don't realize is that we, so by the time you had the second inversion in, in the early 80s, most of the pain was already done and you just started rocketing higher in equities um, uh, in line with that second inversion. The other thing to keep in mind is that this may have already been kind of played out in the fact that we had two quarters of negative GDP growth last year and a 27% peak to trough decline in equities. So uh, I think that we may have already had the impact of that first and second inversion or second inversion last year with the technical recession and the decline in equities that would normally accompany uh, a primary inversion or an exclusive inversion. Uh, we kind of 
took it coincident um, uh, in 2022. So I don't think we're going to get a triple dip. I think we've had, uh, you know, kind of our double dip. We've had our two inversions, but I think the only model you want to be thinking about is the 8082 versus just looking at it in isolation um, where the cycles are spread out by six or seven years. So um, that's how this time is a bit different. And the guy who invented that indicator uh, was on Liz Clayman's show a couple of months ago saying, uh, confirming as, as much, which we've covered many times on the podcast. So, um, okay, so this is the guy, Vinod is asking both about uh, the Brazil ETF EWZ, which we covered, we kind of like, and he's also asking about Nike, which I think is getting overdone here. People are worried about Nike because of China, same with Starbucks. And I think they're going to be surprised um, that it holds in a little bit better than expected. But let's just see here and actually starts to reaccelerate. Same with Estee Lauder, you know, whether it's Starbucks, Nike, Estee Lauder, they've all been hit on China fears. I think there's some opportunities there, but we have enough exposure to China, so we're we're kind of let let others play in that toolbox. Although no one wants to play just yet, they will. Um, all right, so yeah, earnings have been flat. I don't think you have balance sheet concerns with Nike. No, it's fine. Cash flow. Cash flow operations is holding in. Uh, troughed in 2022. Cash from investing is okay. And cash from financing. Let's see, what did they do here? Dividends, repurchase a common stock, a lot of repurchase. That's pretty good. Free cash flow. $4.8 billion worth. Um, let's look at the, uh, where is it? Stock chart. Okay, I got to get ready for TV. Hold on for a second. NKE. So 25 times, it's traded uh, historically at 20 times. So it's still trading at a high multiple. Market's giving it credit for being able to turn around. I mean, this is a good quality business. I think he was asking for the low 80s. If you, look, if you get 80 to 85 again, I think you want to uh, initiate a starter position. Um, <clears throat> I think this will probably be just fine. This is a historic, consistent compounder. A good quality business, a good moat, and they continue to win. So, uh, yeah, I mean, would I buy it tomorrow? I mean, you could, I think if you're going to hold it for the long term, you're probably okay, but I, I would like to get it at lower prices, that's for sure. And I think you've uh, hit the nail on the head, the node there. Uh, wait for lower prices if you can get them. And if you miss it, you miss it. Not the end of the world. Uh, this was the guy talking about Bob, uh, let's see, Chris Peterson, what do you got here for me? Mm -hmm. Okay, so I think so Chris Patterson asks, hi, Tom, I appreciate very much the content you provide for all your listeners. It helps greatly. Uh, my pleasure. Thanks for watching. Um, my question is surrounding diversification. I've always diversified and it has served me well, but take a stock like Cooper Standard. I've reviewed and read about Cooper Standard and agree it works. 
well, it's just rubber stuff that goes around the doors. Yes, it works. Uh, I see no reason that a triple is not in the cards. Even Well, we had a quadruple. We were up 300% from our basis. It's now back to $12 uh, because of uh, UAW strike fears. Uh, so new money that came in and, and funded in the last week or two has been able to take advantage of that. Um, old money that is in at five and a half dollars, they had to, they just have to suck it up for a few weeks until it resolves and goes back up. Um, but uh, when you're running with a very low leverage, it's not a problem. Uh, I see no reason, uh, China. even with the modest market turnaround, Warren had said you only need a few good solid stocks and let them work. Why not put it all in one stock like a Cooper Standard? Uh, what's the argument to spread it out on many stocks? Uh, or do you always diversify no matter what? If an investor is confident in their approach on a stock, why not go all in? Does any scenario make sense to go all in or does the moat matter more for an all in like a Disney? I would never go all in on anything because um, there's always things that you don't know that you don't know. Uh, you can get curveballs like a strike could that last for six months. You know, I mean, if, if Cooper Standard went to zero, we would live to fight another day. Um, but if you had 100% of your net worth in one stock, uh, you'd be done. So um, you just, you can never know what you don't know. I mean, there's this, there's a case for saying, you know, N equals 10. And if you buy 10 qu high quality businesses, don't wait to your highest conviction because you can't predict which one's going to take off and why. I, I'm not of that viewpoint. I, I do think you should wait according to your highest conviction and the highest margin of safety. I think the other thing that you have to keep in mind, Chris, is some of the uh, prospects that have seven or 10 X upside, uh, all, you know, carry some level of risk. Otherwise they wouldn't have that upside. So for instance, we had a huge, you know, or a decent sized risk last year with them getting refinanced in credit markets that were closed. The reason that <clears throat> I was willing to take the risk was that if they didn't get the thing refinanced on their own, I would go out and find someone to finance it for them uh, and find the terms. And I felt that they had enough asset coverage and they had enough, uh, and there was enough operating leverage in the business and things were turning now that once the semiconductor started flowing last summer, that we could get it done. Maybe not under the best terms, but we could get it done and I would have to play an active role to get it done. They got it done on their own, uh, but that was a risk I was willing to take and I knew that I'd have to take actions and it wasn't guaranteed. But you know, we got a company that was a two and a half billion dollar company when it was trading for 70 million and we think it can go back to being a, a, a two, two and a half billion dollar plus company. So, um, but, um, so, you know, and we'll often size the risk according to the expected value. So you're not going to have a 10 X expected value in a stock like Disney or in a stock like Nike, because you know, a lot of the risk is at, out of those businesses. The question with those businesses is just how long do they take to recover and what's your IRR? And that's, that's your real risk is the time because you're in the time arbitrage business, buying a high quality asset or franchise when it's marked down. Um, so the answer to your question is, if you diversify too much uh, and all the statistical analysis says if you're more than 15 stocks you're not there's no way you can outperform uh over time um we like to stay in the 8 to 12 range when we can uh unless we've got some that like have a super high expected value and maybe they're a two or three percent position because they could go to zero or they could be a 10x and we just have to have a little participation but more often than not we're just in eight or eight or twelve good businesses that we like, uh, long long dated derivative overlay, and then we reserve the right to do asymmetric shorts with long premium when uh, the everything is stacked up in our favor. Uh, we don't think that coming out of a once in a hundred year uh, scenario where businesses are just recovering and things are just getting started is an ideal time to be doing shorts uh, after we're long in the expansion three or four years out or maybe as soon as the year after the election is often a weak year there'll be some opportunities for us to do asymmetric bets but uh to the short side uh, but um that it's unlikely it will impact our positioning on the long side we'll just have overlays uh and do that at the appropriate time 
But um, so in terms of how we look at it, I would say never less, more, less than five stocks. If you really want to be concentrated, I think that's still too concentrated. But if you want to outperform, it's very it's going to be very, very hard to do with more than 15 stocks. And, um, and I'll leave it at that. And you'll figure out your, your kind of philosophy as you go along. And then the key is making sure you have quality because if you don't have that, then none of it matters. So, um, all right. And finally, uh, Brazil and Nike. We did that already. He sent it to me twice. All right. So with that said, I want to thank everyone for tuning in. We'll be back next week, same time, different place. We'll actually be coming to you from, uh, I don't know if we'll be, we'll either be in Algarve or Sintra that day in Portugal. Uh, but uh, the beauty is because of the time zone, I can basically work, can do the sightseeing for like, six or eight hours before the u.s markets open which is pretty exciting um and then uh spend the rest of the day doing vacation stuff and i have some business stuff over there and some family stuff so uh anyway very excited for uh to come live from portugal to you next week thank you for tuning in this week we'll we'll see you next week in the meantime make it a great one bye for now